Welcome to the Butterfly Effect. Today is stage eight of the Giro d'Italia. This race was spectacular. From the start of the race until 116 kilometers to go, I mean, it is absolutely spectacular. The action is insane. I'm so glad I woke up early and turned the race on from kilometer zero because it was a crescendo at the start. I mean, absolutely amazing race. There's splits in the field. It's broken up three, four, five times, and there's riders all over the place. So let's get down to business. 170 kilometers, about 105 miles in length. There's only two categorized climbs, and it will finish on a climb, but a small category four with about two kilometers of steepness in there, but not crazy steep at all. It was actually a fairly easy summit finish on today's stage but the beginning will make up for anything that they have to fight through at the finish on the last climb. Now, Ineos are riding spectacular. They're all over the front. They're in the first split, and when this, sometimes there's five, six splits in the field at times early in the first 10 kilometers of this race. There's that many splits, and it's Ineos up there with Egon Bernal. First, I see him. He's up there solo in a big group of like 25, I'm thinking this isn't a great move for race leader to be up there of someone that's such a big favorite. We know he's not the race leader, but unofficially, he's the number one marked guy up there. Guys right away in the break are yelling at him to get out, but I'm sorry. You don't get out. Once you're in there, you're already in. So you stay in there. If, that, if you have to kill that break or whatever you got to do, do it. But it's not necessarily a good place to be if you're such a favorite like Egon Bernal because you're burning some matches to be up there is what I thought when I first saw it. Now, what really happened is that race leader Valters, the FDJ rider, he's somewhere lost in the back, but we don't know that. When I first saw Egon Bernal up front, we don't know that it's Valters is lost and his FDJ teammates are scattered throughout the field from behind Walters. He's not in front. It's not, he's not got any help from FDJ in these early parts of the race, and he's not doing himself any favor with his positioning during the race. In the echelon conditions, when you see a bike race like this, it's a big bunch up in the front, and it's hard to stay up there, but usually there's 30, maybe 50 strong guys up there, and you can find some good places to be with a little bit of experience. Now, there's multiple ways that teams will go into a stage like today. You could be a rider on GC, like Walters, the pink jersey wear, or you could be a guy attacking to be in the break. Throughout my professional career, I've done both. I've been race leader, and I've had the race for team classification at the Tour de France, where I have to cover attacks left and right 20 times on these same kind of conditions. It is incredibly difficult. But if you're race leader, like Walters, it's really not a difficult stage at the beginning if you put yourself in the right position all the time. There's usually a little space at the front where there's five, six, seven, eight guys wide. You might have to fight sometimes when it strings out to make sure you're at the front, but you have to stay at the front so that when it bunches up, you have that beautiful draft there. He's always in the back. He's it's always cross when happening. I mean, the flags are just dead straight on today's stage. And he's stuck back there in the wind the whole time with no teammates around him. Finally, the break gets away after 60, 70 kilometers of racing. And it's eight guys going up the road with Victor Campanots. My man, Victor, he's back there bridging across. He's going to bridge for 10 kilometers more or less before he attaches on to the eight guys up front. Victor did an amazing job. He is just a powerful man on the pedals. He is so impressive. When it comes to pushing on the, on the pedals, nobody does it much better than Victor Campanots at these times in the middle and just before the very finishing of the stage. Now, in the back, after the break gets away, there's nobody that's a threat in that group of nine to the GC race leader, FDJ rider. Walter and so FDJ is able to bring everything back as one whole piece and they'll set tempo most of the stage. There's not much else to talk about when it comes to the GC race for today's stage because they'll really tempo in until the last climb, do a little hard tempo up the last climb, but nothing spectacular happens. All the action is up in the break. The breakaway really starts getting interesting with about 40 kilometers to go when Fernando Gaviria, this Colombian sprinter legend, decides to attack. Great tactic in my mind because they got a long descent. He can't climb, so he's got to get some time on the breakaway companions. 
He attacks, flies in to a right hand turn that's tighter than we than he would know it, and he'll crash himself out of the brake at that particular moment. He'll get back in by holding on to the medical car that'll tape him up and spray him down. You legally can hold on to the medical car, and so he's holding on, and I'm sure he's yelling at those guys to punch it, and they get him back to the front group, but he's completely wrecked and missing skin all down the right side of his body. His race will be more or less over. Up front with 20 kilometers to go in the break is when Victor Campanots puts on the Victor show. And this is a show of two victors at this particular breakaway. But first is Victor Campanots, and he is throwing down. He attacks five, six, seven, eight times during that last 20K before we really get into the climb proper. Finally, he gets off with the Italian rider Carboni. Okay. Those two are working well together for one, two kilometers before Carboni finally throws in a dig and drops Victor Campanots. But it's not going to be the end for Victors in this particular race because it's Victor Lafay that comes from the back group out of, out of the break, bridges across, and then drops Carboni directly. He catches Carboni, flies right past him on the right, and solos into the finish for a Kofidis win. Kofidis have not had a win in a Grand Tour in something like a decade or over a decade. So it's a spectacular victory for Kofidis as a team. And for the young kid, Lafay, it is a beautiful win. He raced it perfectly, always hidden, always out of trouble, and never doing any extra work. Every time Victor Campanots was attacking back there, you would see that it was, it was more really Nelson Oliveira that was chasing more than anybody else and Victor Lafay was just quiet back there. I never even saw him really in the break. He did such a good job of staying out of trouble and never aggressive and never covering, never being the first to cover moves. But when he threw in his attack to bridge the gap up to Carboni, it was impressive and he closed it within seconds and dislodged him within 25, 50 meters after catching his wheel. Congratulations. Victor Lafay, it was a spectacular win, and Kofidis, you got your win. Now let's go back to the GC favorites because I said nothing happened, and it's true. When they came to the line, nothing happened, but race leader Valter, I told you already, he was having a hard beginning of the race, always in a terrible position. When I was racing as GC rider, you have to stay up in that front part of that bubble, like I was saying. He was never there. Today, he suffered. When he crossed the finish line in that group today, he looked terrible. He was at the back the whole time, and he only has a very small few, few amount of seconds between second, third, fourth, and fifth. I mean, we're talking a minute between the whole top 10 guys to his pink jersey, so you cannot afford to be back there in 30th position. He just barely misses a crash there with about 2K to go, where they almost one of the riders almost fell on top of him. He go, luckily avoids that, goes around the right, but clearly does not have great legs. Now, what does this mean for tomorrow's stage? In my opinion, he's going to be bad tomorrow unless today was just about calories. Now, when he's back there for the first 60K in terrible position and fighting in the wind all the time when the crosswind's coming and he's got no teammates around him, at that moment, it's impossible to think about eating and drinking at that moment. So maybe if Walter's really lucky, maybe today was just about lack of calories and that's why he was so bad at the finish of today's stage. If it was about the amount of energy that he spent today, and he can't put it back with calories lost on today's stage, look for him tomorrow to have a very bad day and he's gonna lose that pink jersey, certainly on tomorrow's stage. If he does race the same way that he did today, it was absolutely terrible racing from the FDJ rider. Today's stage, exciting. The finish the, with the two victors left us with something to cheer and look forward, look, look forward to in today's stage. But tomorrow's race is going to be on now. I'm sure the teams tonight will talk about the FDJ rider Valters, how bad of positioning he had throughout today's stage and how he looked at the finish on a Category 4 Summit finish and how bad he looked on that particular climb. Hope you guys like the butterfly effect. Like and subscribe. And I'll see you for Stage 9 of the Giro d'Italia.